Good morning, Fort Worth Bible. So good to be in the house of the Lord once again. I don't know what kind of week y'all been having, but mine has been kind of crazy. But God has still been so good to me. He's been good to you. I'm going on about three hours of sleep, but some, you know, I know God was, sometime when God talks to me, he talks to me very simple. I don't know how he, he speaks to you. And, you know, and I'm sitting there going, man, I really didn't want to get up. And, he, you know, I'm, I could almost hear him say, you know, what? Well, that's fine. You don't, I mean, you don't need me or anything. So you don't have to get up. I know you were busy this week, but, you know, I wasn't doing anything. But if you want to stay home, that's, it's fine. So this is how God conversates with me. And, you know, and after that conversation, you see where we are today. I'm here. I'm getting up because God is so worthy of all the praise and the honor. And I'm going to get up and I'm going to give him my everything because he gave me his everything. So we ask that you guys will stand up. We want you to join us in our time of praise and worship. It's not a time for we just... You're watching us. We want to stand because he's been good to you also, just like he's been good to us. So we want you to just join us in our time of praise, Lord. We're going to start off in this song. It's called Emmanuel. He's the King of King, and he's the Lord alone. We worship you this morning. to give a praise, just worship and adore him.
a sacrifice of praise to you, Jesus. We worship you. 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 We're so grateful, Lord. We're so thankful, Lord. We worship you. We love you. We love you, Lord. We worship you. It's a good thing to worship the Lord. We worship you. In spirit and in truth, we worship you today. We worship you. worship you. Yeah, here we go. We worship you. Anybody got a reason to worship him in the house? We worship you. I tell you, God has been very good to us because we're here today. We worship you. Somebody's not able to be in the place of worship. But while we have an opportunity, our hands are raised, our voices are raised. We worship you. And we are just going to worship the King of Kings. One day we're going to see we him face to face. You. But until that time, we just want to worship you. Worship you, Lord. We worship you. With our whole hearts. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We worship you. You're such a good God. We're so grateful. We worship you. For your many blessings. For your many blessings. Your breakthroughs. We worship you. Delivering us from dangers seen and unseen. seated in the Lord's house. Welcome to Fort Worth Bible Fellowship. We thank you for being with us during this time of worship. We thank all the saints who are in the house with us today and those who are online. We worship God here in this place and we're grateful to him. Oh, his name is Emmanuel. And that is not only God with us, but the word means that God became one of us. And so we worship him, the, the God man, the one who took away all of our sins, redeemed us back to the Father in his wonderful, willing sacrifice. How wonderful he is. And we pray that you're worshiping him today also. Again, thank you so much for being with us. We're grateful that you have chosen to worship here with us at Fort Worth Bible Fellowship. Uh, today we want to begin a time of celebration and observation of how wonderful God is to send his son. And you know that's not just one day that we observe that on Christmas Day, but every day those who belong to God, we recognize and celebrate that he came to this planet took upon the form of man, came in the flesh, God himself, and redeemed us back to himself. What a wonderful story it is. So again, we are praying that while you are worshiping this morning, praising his name, because his name is Emmanuel, that you were preparing your table also, the Lord's table. This is that time of worship where we are so blessed to have this intimate moment with God. It's an, ordin an, an ordinance of the church that he has commanded that we observe, and that is uh, his Holy Communion. But something that is very important that we will never and should never forget is that we have to do a self-assessment as we come before the Lord. And that self-assessment is the confession of our known sins. And we say the confession of our known sins because we don't know every sin that we have committed, but God says that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so that cleansing power takes care of those sins that we aren't even aware of, the, the ones that we've committed in ignorance. He is so faithful and just. 
So again, we pray that you have been preparing your table, the Lord's table, with your food and your drink as we give ourselves to his holy communion. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much as you have ordained this time for your children so that we will remember what Christ has accomplished for us. And then, God, in that remembrance, we seek forgiveness from repentant hearts because you said that that is what activates your forgiveness and your cleansing power in our lives, and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, do we pray. Amen. The scripture shares with us that on the night in which our God was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, then he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples who were with him, and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. As often as you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me. And as God has said, let us all eat together. Then after the supper, the Lord, he took the cup and he said that this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which was shed for the remission of many sins. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. And as God has said, let us all drink together. Amen. You know, I uh, was reminded of a little song tells us what can wash away my sins and the answer is nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is that flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. We pray that you're covered by the blood. We worship him today. And as we continue to worship him, we come to the throne of God to bring our treasures. He has given us everything that we have. There's nothing that we have that he has not first given to us. And so we come to bring our treasures. And so as we do that, we remember that God has provided everything for us, that he is the great provider. And only are we able to give to him because he's first given to us. So you should be seeing on your screen the ability to give online through this ministry. And that's a very important notice through this ministry, not necessarily to this ministry because you're giving to the Lord. And so with that, we thank those who've been visiting with us, who, who've been giving through this ministry because it definitely is a blessing. But we want you to always remember that you always are supporting your home church because the work of God goes on, goes on in every place that's open in the name of Jesus Christ. And so we thank him for that. So again... Uh, Utilize the information that's on the screen so that you are able to give and bless the Lord. And we remember that it's not for uh, our benefit or, or it's not for God's benefit because God, he owns everything already. So it is to our benefit that we give to the, to the mighty king who needs nothing. And we praise him. Let's, let's bless the Lord's treasure. Father, thank you so much for all you are for us, and we bring our offerings, Lord, and ask that you would use them as you see fit for the glory of yourself. We praise you, Father. Thank you so much in the name of Jesus. Amen. So just wanting to, uh, again, say hello and welcome. I want to share a couple of things with you as far as our announcements are concerned. Uh, we're coming up again on the end of the year and leading into January, we, we like to always give feedback and information to the saints of everything that has gone on during the year. And we do that with our uh, end of the year review 
So that will be coming up in the January time frame as we close out uh, the end of this year. You know, God has done so many wonderful things here at Fort Worth Bible Fellowship, even in the midst of the COVID activity and the, and the COVID restrictions. But he has been faithful to us. And so we want to recognize that and share that with the saints because although we haven't been together throughout uh, the year, most of this year and then last year, uh, God has done so many magnificent things, and we just want to share that and make sure that we give God all the glory that he is due. And also with that, we'll be um, making sure that everyone gets the opportunity to sign up for a ministry for the upcoming year, uh, getting back into uh, worshiping together and being in fellowship together and also serving together is something that we look forward to because that's what God has called us to do, right? We are to serve together, serve alongside with one, uh, one another so that he is honored. So we will be making sure that everyone gets an opportunity to sign up for a ministry uh, this upcoming year. So please take advantage of that as we are getting back to uh, our serving together alongside one another. It's been a, a marvelous uh, month when it comes to the teaching that God has been sharing with us. We've been looking at his doctrine on uncompromising Christians. And so he's been ministering to us to keep us encouraged of, in how we are to stay steadfast in our walk with him so that we won't, we won't compromise or don't compromise with the world and the world's ways. But we're going to have a treat today, of course, and that treat is from our brother uh, in the ministry, Pastor John Cantor, who is here with us to share with us about one of these great festivals that our Lord observed. And in that observation, we're going to learn more about our Savior and then more about this feast of dedication, and which is surprising to many, maybe, uh, what we are recognizing during this Christmas time. So uh, I look forward to it as always, Pastor Cantor, and I'll, sit, I'll share more about him uh, once he gets ready to minister to us, but I'm going to stop talking now and let the praise go on. So if you know it, please sing along. Let's praise his name. go back. You know, I was sitting here thinking about um, back, back in the day. I don't know how old some of you all are, but old folk used to say, I looked at my hands and they looked new. I looked at my feet and they looked new too. Mine didn't change, but my heart changed. And I was like, thank you, Lord. You know, yeah. And I was like, what, what changed about your hand? <laughs> you know, but that was their expression of not going back. They were saying, we're glad that the Lord did something in our life. So today, this song says, I won't go back. We're glad about what Jesus has done in our lives and what he's doing in our lives. So sing with us if you know this song. And even if you don't, sing with us because it's up on the screen. So we invite you. Okay.
has for us. Forgiven. Forgiven. Cast into the sea of forgetfulness. No more shame. Why? Twenty-five plus years, and so uh, his teaching is wonderful, and we really enjoy the blessing of Pastor Cantor and the perspective that he brings. And so many believers, Christians, don't get this particular teaching enough. Uh, this perspective that he brings from his background and being a Jewish believer, being one who is in Christ. His perspective is always a blessing to us because we don't know enough about the roots of Judaism and how they spring and lead to uh, our Savior coming. Because we know that salvation is of, from the Jews. And so we bless, his, we bless his name for God's magnificent and wonderful plan 
that a man cannot, of course, could have conceived in and of himself. So we know that this is the almighty God at work and he alone. So we, we bless God's name today and again. Uh, our friend, Pastor John Cantor, coming to us from John chapter 10 and the dedication celebration. Pastor Cantor. Good to be with you, and well, I'll tell you, I haven't seen so many folks on horseback since I, uh, my bar mitzvah in Knott's Berry Farm in California. It was wild. But we are here. It's good to, boy, was that a uplifting worship set or what? Good stuff, absolutely. We don't want to go back because we've, we're experiencing something infinitely better. Well, um, my topic today, I think, is timely. It's seasonal, in fact, you could say. You know, it's interesting, every year, and seemingly earlier every year, both Christmas and Hanukkah get very blurry, get very distorted, out of focus. In fact, I think we could all agree... Um, Brother, perhaps we could just uh, turn my mic volume down just a hair. That would be, that'd be super. See, sometimes when people get older, their voices get softer. But with me, it's the opposite. It's an old, old radio thing there. Is that good? You'll, you can hear me. Great. So as I was saying, I think it's um, something that's plainly evident. And really in today's, um, what's often referred to, thought of as a a post-truth in culture and society. As I was saying, it would seem that Christmas and Hanukkah very often get blurry, distorted, out of focus. And really, uh, that kind of thing, I think, comes upon us earlier and earlier. Uh, it used to be right after Halloween. Now I, I start to <laughs> see stuff actually before Halloween. Or, so it's kind of crazy. But another way of saying that talking about this is, I think, unrestrained materialism, if I can say it like that. Unrestrained materialism sometimes becomes the driving force behind a kind of American civil religion that expresses itself in things like pious platitudes, uh, Santa Claus, uh, reindeer, and of course the obligatory exchange of cards and presents. You say, where are you going with it? Where are you going with that, Ebenezer Scrooge? I like all of that stuff. I like it too. See, the reason I'm wearing the talit, the prayer shawl this morning, I, I thought it might get me through the parade quicker, but it didn't, didn't work out that way. But no, seriously, we're, we're wearing this today as an expression of reverence, expression of, of um, worship, uh, the, the kippah, the uh, yarmulke, the skull cap covering. And these, uh, along with the prayer shawl here, these are items that are part of the uh, Jewish tradition, again, as an expression of reverence, an expression of worship. And since we're, uh, we're doing something holy this morning, are we not? Yeah. We're doing something sanctified. We, we don't want to go back. We're focusing on better things. So, so again, uh, you know, we don't have to diss the culture. I, that's not where I'm coming from. But what I'm saying, at, at best, this kind of Christmas, uh, typically, a, you know, just a secular view of Christmas at its best, becomes a, a time of family togetherness. You know, it's like the Hallmark Channel on steroids, right? But by and large, little if any thought is given to the second person of the, the triune God, the eternal Son of glory who became one of us to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, becoming our Redeemer. You know, for many of our Jewish people, Hanukkah has really become kind of a a Jewish version of Christmas, true. And uh, as we said, like Christmas, Hanukkah can easily become blurry, distorted, out of focus. In fact, several years ago, there was an interesting article 
titled The December Dilemma, which appeared in the publication Dallas Jewish Life. And in that article, there was this description of the holiday season. The writer wrote, it's that time of year again. Christmas trees are everywhere you turn. They're in stores, they're in tree lots, they're in your your neighbor's home, maybe even in your home. The doctor is asking your child what he wants for Christmas. And your local grocery market has aisles of Christmas decorations, but doesn't carry Hanukkah gift wrap paper. The store manager wishes you Merry Christmas as you leave the store empty-handed. This is a season when Jewish children and Jewish adults often become most acutely aware that somehow they're different, you know, that they don't fit into the cultural mainstream. In fact, children try to understand why everyone else is involved, seemingly involved in a celebration that just doesn't seem to include them. And Jewish adults often still feel the struggle, the struggle of seasonal discomfort caused, again, by being so obviously separate and apart from the status quo, end of quote. Now, perhaps you weren't aware of this, but actually the the practice of gift-giving at Hanukkah, uh, one gift can be traced, often I think it can be traced, to those members of our people who seek to perhaps want to kind of put the kibosh, want to uh, lessen some of these, these uncomfortable feelings of being different from the majority. Well, having lived what I, I think is a rather typical Jewish-American experience in many respects, I know that these feelings of feeling different are not unusual. As a, as a child, I sometimes felt them myself. But now I know, praise God I know, by the grace of God I know that really the only cure for this kind of uneasiness, this kind of unsettledness in our spirit is a biblical, God-centered view of the holidays and myself. I am that I am, maybe who I am, amen? My friends, when our focus is fixed on the one who is the real reason for the season, as the old saying goes, when it's not about the mall, when it's about the manger, (laughs) as we used to say back in the day, right? Uh, You know, when our focus is fixed on who he is, what he has done, what he's about, we can know the freedom the liberation, the joy of being secure in whom God has created us to be. We no longer feel this game, to feel this materialistic deal of one-upsmanship, you know, the latest, the greatest, and the biggest toys. You know. Anxiety is replaced by shalom, by contentment. Perhaps you recall, and I'm really dating myself here, I, you see, I just, um, about a month ago, I went on Medicare, and... Uh, yeah, it was an, an eventful week for me. Um, uh, one day I, I, uh, I went on Medicare, and then um, uh, the next day actually was, was my birthday. And to, to celebrate, I, I did the early bird special at Luby's. It was, it was a bang-up day, I want to tell you. But anyway, going back to 1965, perhaps you recall, that was the year the original Charlie Brown Christmas special came out. Charles Schultz was a Christian, right? Some of you know that creator of the, that strip, Peanuts. And um, so in the original Charlie Brown Christmas special, you may remember there was that great scene where in desperation Charlie Brown cries out, hey, is there anyone, anyone here at all who can tell me what Christmas is all about, right? And what happened at that point? Well, Charlie, or rather Linus, tells Charlie Brown about the birth of Jesus. So what I'm going to do, since I'm wearing the Talit, the prayer shawl, and the, the kippah, and the yarmulke. I'm going to kind of play the role of a messianic Linus this morning and share with you what I'm convinced Hanukkah is all about. All right? My friends, I'm convinced when you, when you strip away all of the extraneous bells and whistles, when you really boil it down to its core, what Hanukkah is about is about God being faithful true. Did you catch that this morning? Hanukkah is about God being faithful. And because God is faithful, specifically faithful, in keeping His prophetic promises, there was light once again in a desecrated temple. A temple, a physical temple here on earth that had been 
desecrated by vile, blatant, in-your-face idolatry was made usable again for both priestly service and worship. Now, it's interesting. You won't find the word Hanukkah in the Hebrew Scriptures. You won't find it in the Old Testament. And the reason for that is that the festival actually began during what we call the intertestamental period, the period of time between the Old and New Testaments. However, in two places, in the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel prophetically speaks of events from which this feast arose. Now, one of these passages is Daniel 8, verses 9 through 14. In fact, why don't we turn there, if we could? Daniel 8. We'll actually be looking at a a number of different passages this morning, but we want to begin today with Daniel 8, again, verses 9 through 14, because in that passage, there's someone talked about who is referred to as the little horn. Now, my friends, this little horn was a genuine historical figure. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes, and he was also known as Antiochus IV. Now, he was the king over Syria from the years 175 to 164 B.C., or as Jewish historians mark time, B.C.E., which means before Christ even. No jokes today, just cute stuff. All right, just kidding. No, actually, speaking of the marking of time, um, it's a, it, kind of tongue-in-cheek here. You know, we're about to go into uh, um, 2022, right? So I say uh, 2022 B.C., before COVID, you see. That's, anyway, it keeps it straight in my head. All right. As you get older, you need these things to kind of keep it together. All right, so again, he was king of Syria from the years 175 to 164 B.C., and here's the deal. He added the name Epiphanes, Epiphanes to his handle, which means, get a load of this, the manifest God, Epiphanes, meaning God manifest. Why? Because he believed himself to be just that. That's how wacky he was, God in human flesh. That's how he viewed himself. Well, the Jews of that day (laughs) were kind of clever. They changed just one consonant in his name, and instead of calling him Antiochus Epiphanes, they referred to him as Antiochus Epitomes, which means Antiochus the madman, because he thought he was God in human flesh, right? So, in Daniel 8, 9 through 14, we're told what Antiochus' activities are and how long they'll last. But before we get into that, let's kind of set the stage here, just a a bit of the historical context. In brief, here's what's happening. Here's what's going on. Alexander the Great has conquered the land of Israel, and he's made it part of his Greek empire. Now, when Alexander dies, his empire is divided into four separate kingdoms. And two of these kingdoms actually affected the history of Israel. In fact, those two kingdoms were Syria and Egypt. In fact, Israel kind of became a, something of a political football between Syria and Egypt. So after being under Egyptian control, Israel then fell under Syrian control in the year 198 B.C. Another problem for the Jewish people during this time was the enforcement of Hellenistic or Greek culture. In fact, the Jewish historian Josephus writes about Levitical priests who would leave the temple, leave their duties in the temple so they could participate in the Greek games, the precursor to the modern Olympic games. They would do this so they could participate in the Greek games, which actually at that time, believe it or not, were (laughs) held in the nude. I mean, it was a depraved culture, seriously. So going back to Antiochus, we should note that he made two major military campaigns against Egypt. In the first campaign, despite gaining a great deal of spoil, he was unable to take possession of Egypt. Couldn't quite pull it off. In his second campaign, he was on the verge of taking control of Egypt, but then the Romans came in and forced him to retreat. Well, as you can imagine, Antiochus was not a happy camper, right? So what did he do? He lashed out on history's favorite whipping boy, the Jews. (laughs) He made the Jews the scapegoat, the excuse for his military failure, his defeat. And you you see, rather, that brings us to the events which brought about the Maccabean revolt against Antiochus 
And with that revolt, the feast of Hanukkah, again, which we find prophetically mentioned in Daniel 8, 9 through 14. So let's look at that passage. It reads, Out of one of them came another horn, which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord, and it took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord, and his sanctuary was thrown down. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown down to the ground. Verse 13, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take? How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled, the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary, and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people? He said to me, It will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. In other words, at that time, the temple will will be rededicated and made usable again for priestly service and corporate worship. So far, so good? Notice some of you have your heads down, your eyes closed. Appreciate your praying. All right. It's a praying congregation. That's good. Feeling the love this today. So Antiochus, here's what's happening. Antiochus, recently defeated in Egypt, expresses his frustration by attacking Judea, the southern kingdom. And what does he do? He ruthlessly slaughters innocent men, women, and children. He invades the temple. He forbids the practice of circumcision. Why is that significant? Because it's the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. He doesn't allow for the observance of Shabbat, the Sabbath, or Kashrut, the keeping of the dietary laws. In fact, he commanded, get a load of this, he commanded that only pigs be sacrificed in the temple. In fact, he actually cooked a pig on the altar and poured its broth on the holy scrolls of Torah. God's instruction for doing life. But of even greater significance, even bigger than all of that, Antiochus Epiphanes had a statue of his god, Zeus Olympus, which was fashioned after a man, carried it into the temple, and he demanded that Jewish people bow down and worship that image. Why did he do that? He did this. His purpose in this was to humiliate the Jewish people by polluting the temple and seeking to totally assimilate them, both culturally and religiously, totally immerse them into the Syrian empire. Well, Antiochus' plans would not be realized. Amen? Kind of like Joseph, right? The story of Joseph, which is actually the, the Torah portion right now. In the Jewish world, you know, you have the annual cycle of readings in uh, Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, and in Deuteronomy, and so now we're in the, in the, the story of Joseph and with uh, man meant for evil, God used for good, right? Antiochus' plans would not be realized. God raised up a band of godly Jews led by the priest Mattathias and his five sons, and they rebelled against the Syrians. They fled into the wilderness. They began guerrilla-style war against Antiochus and his Syrian army. And this was the greatest military upset of all time. The Syrians were defeated and eventually driven from the land. Now, let's pause and reflect on this. Following the victory, following this this unbelievable upset, what do you think the first order of business was for the Jewish people after this great military victory? It was cleansing that polluted temple. It was making right that desecrated place service and worship to Hashem, Yahweh, the true and living God. Why? Because the killing of a pig and the statue of a heathen deity, Zeus Olympus, again, fashioned after a man in the temple of the true and living God, had made that temple unusable. But a bit of a problem. There was no sanctified oil to light the temple to make cleansing of the temple possible. And that problem was compounded by the fact that this oil had to be prepared by priests within the temple. So what are we going to do? Well, according to 
tradition, Jewish tradition, and if any of you happen to ever catch Fiddler on the Roof, you know that tradition is very big, right, in Jewish culture. According to tradition, one small jar of oil was found, and it should have lasted only one day, right? But miraculously, it is said to have lasted a period of eight days, eight days until a new supply could be prepared and consecrated. And you see, all of this background is the beginning of the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, which is wrapping up tonight. Tonight is the eighth night, also known as the Feast of Lights or the Feast of Dedication. So going back to the Daniel 8 prophecy of temple restoration, we find the historical fulfillment of this prophecy in the apocryphal books of First and Second Maccabees. Now, unlike our friends in the Roman Catholic tradition, Protestants and Messianics, generally speaking, do not regard these apocryphal books as being divinely inspired, but they do give us a reliable history of what happened during that time. And when we look at these apocryphal books, we can piece together when we connect the dots historically, we see that on the date of September the 9th, 171 B.C., the godly high priest Onias III was murdered. And moving from that to December the 25th, gee, that date has a familiar ring to it, does it not? <laughs> December the 25th, 165 B.C., the temple was rededicated. So you say, John, where are you going with this? Simply this. When you crunch the numbers, when you do the math, the number of days between these two events, again, the godly high priest, Onias III, his murder, and then the temple being restored, the period of time between those two events, when it's all added up, guess what it comes out to? Exactly 2,300 days. The precise length of time which God promised the sanctuary would be reestablished, cleansed. This prophecy of temple restoration was literally fulfilled. Isn't that cool? Absolutely. So what are we saying today? We're saying at the end of the day, Hanukkah is about God being faithful. Chesed, covenantal love and loyalty, faithful in his promises, loyal in his love. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His character is consistent unchanging, and he is faithful to see that every jot and tittle, the minutia, all of the details of his prophetic word is literally fulfilled. Well, secondly this morning, because God is faithful, faithful in keeping his prophetic word, not only was there light, once again, in a desecrated temple, but there is also messianic light in the redemptive, in the divine person and redemptive work of first century Jewish Yeshua of Nazareth, right? The faithfulness of God is seen in the fulfillment of his prophetic messianic word, light in the world. Fast forward with me now, going from Daniel 8, let's go to John chapter 10. And we're looking at verse 22 of that chapter where the feast of dedication is mentioned. This is another name for Hanukkah. Now, in terms of how John, the Apostle John, develops his gospel, the various themes in his gospel, this verse, verse 22, is preceded by and connected to John 7, 1 through John 10, 21. And that section, John 7, 1 through John 10, 21, is a section that deals with events in the life of Jesus during the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. In fact, you may recall that tabernacles is an eight-day period of time which remembers what? What does it commemorate? God's care of his people, right? During their 40 years of wilderness wandering. So where are we going with this? Well, I find it interesting that the eight days of Hanukkah are apparently based on the eight days of the Feast of Tabernacles. You see, when Antiochus controlled Jerusalem, the Jewish people were unable to observe the Feast of Tabernacles when they normally would have. But once the temple was rededicated, they proceeded to observe the eight days of tabernacles three months later. 
than they normally would have. And from that situation came the concept of the eight days of Hanukkah, actually a copy of the eight days of the Feast of Tabernacles. So it's really no accident when you look at the flow of John's gospel, it's no accident that after, discuss, after discussing the Feast of Tabernacles in John 7, John 7, 1 through John 10, 21, John then shifts to talking about the life of Jesus in relationship to the next feast, the Feast of Hanukkah, which we see in John 10, 22 through 39. So what we're saying today is simply this. Just as the concept of light in the eight days originated from the Feast of Tabernacles, in same fashion, in the same way, in John's Gospel, the Feast of Hanukkah, the events of Hanukkah, in the time of Christ, also came out of the Feast of Tabernacles. Does that make sense? All right. I'm kind of a connect-the-dots guy. That's what I do. But I try to be creative and color outside the lines. I don't want to be up, too uptight about it, but you know, I'm a big picture guy. So hopefully this is clear. Now, it was during the Feast of Tabernacles that Jesus did what? What did he say about himself? He declared himself to be what? The light of the world, right? You see, the, this imagery of light is very significant. Jesus chose to use the imagery of light to describe himself during the Feast of Tabernacles. Why? Because it's something his audience would understand. It's something they would be familiar with. In fact, when he said this, I am the light of the world, he was speaking in that part of the temple where candles burned to symbolize the pillar of fire that led the people of Israel through these 40 years of wandering in a desert wasteland. This pillar of fire represented God's presence, his protection, his guidance. <laughs> Seriously, what an appropriate setting for Jesus to declare himself to be the light of the world in terms of his presence, his promise, and his protection. Amen? Well, three months later, Jesus uses the occasion of Hanukkah to make more claims concerning himself. In response to the charge, dude, are you the Messiah or not? What's the deal here? Jesus makes three dramatic statements. What does he do? First, he asserts his oneness with the Father. You've seen me. You've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. What does he mean by that? In this context, he means that he and the Father are united. They're on the same page in guaranteeing the eternal destiny of all who trust in him. And in light, in light of the response to that claim, how did the Religious leadership of that day, what did they do with that? Tragically, they picked up stones. They, they tried to take them out. So what Jesus is saying here is a not-so-subtle, it's a not-so-subtle affirmation of his deity, his oneness of essence and being with the Father. Now, in verses 37 and 38 of this section, John 10, notice that Jesus invites his audience to believe in him. Why? Hey, because of the works that I do, right? You don't believe what I say. Believe me on the basis of what I do, right? Hey, if my works are the works of the Father, you know I'm the real deal. My works, what I do, prove that he is in me and I am in him. We're inseparable. We have always eternally coexisted with one another. And so if his audience believed that, if they trusted in that, they would believe, and that belief would result in forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and ultimately even the impartation of the Spirit. That's the new covenant, right? Ezekiel, Jeremiah, the Spirit of God coming to live with us, within us. And it's the internalization of God's instruction for doing life. Just a powerful, powerful thing in addition to forgiveness of sin and eternal life. So, powerful stuff going on. Jesus is asserting his oneness with the Father, and then he declares his position of sonship with the Father, affirmation of his deity. I'm a terrible speller, but here's how you spell deity. D-E-I, because deity can never die. That's the way to 
<laughs> Remember how to spell deity. Before spell check, I was vermished. I was misspelling words all over the place. But that's how I remember to spell deity correctly. D-E-I, deity can never die. Now let's bring this back to Hanukkah. Let's go back to Hanukkah. While Jewish tradition says that the great miracle of Hanukkah, one day's supply of temple oil miraculously lasting eight nights, eight days, the Word of God says on this particular Hanukkah, an infinitely greater miracle took place. Amen? In fulfillment of the Torah and Nevim Ketuvim, the law, the prophets, and the writings, God became a man to die for man so that those who would believe would receive spiritual liberation, a liberation that cannot be lost. And because we have this eternal salvation, we can walk in the light, the light of the world, because the spirit of he who is the light of the world lives in us 24-7. So Hanukkah is about God being faithful. Because God is faithful, there was not only light, physical light, in a formerly desecrated temple due to idolatry, there was also messianic light in the person, divine person, and redemptive work of Jesus of Nazareth. Well, thirdly today, because God is faithful, faithful to complete the work of redemption that he has begun in us, our light as believers can and should shine. Amen? As we sang today, it's crazy to go back. It's crazy to go back. I'm paraphrasing it, but that's essentially what you were saying, right? There's no sense in going back. Let's turn now to 1 John. The book of 1 John, chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. And building on what we looked at in the Gospel of John, chapters 8 and 9, where, again, Messiah declared himself to be the, the light of the world, emphasizing his deity, his oneness with the Father. This passage in 1 John also talks about this concept, this imagery of light, as a result of his coming as the light. Those who formerly walked in darkness, those who do not walk in accordance with the Word of God, they don't have fellowship with God. But those who do walk in the light, we do have fellowship with God. There is relational intimacy. We have fellowship with others who are also walking in that same light. A koinonia, we have community. And as Pastor alluded to, because of COVID, that the, normally, the normal way we have done community has been interrupted, but we're thankful for the technology. But, you know, now we're facing Omicron, but hey, we got the Alpha and Omega, right? So it's <laughs> at the end of the day, it all, all comes out in the wash. But uh, anyway. So let's get practical for just a moment. Once we become a believer, what happens? We become a child of light, spiritually speaking, do we not? And here's the thing. As believers, we will always be children of light, but obviously we don't always walk in light. You know, we, we choose to act out, to, to, to be rebellious, to, to live independently of God. And so our obligation is to walk in light, and this is in reference to the light of the Word of God. That's our illumination. The, the Spirit is our empowerment. The, the, the Word in combination with the Spirit and the dynamic of relational intimacy with the triune God gives us what we need to walk in light, to have this, this sense of what we were created for, this, this, this fellowship. But not only do we have fellowship with God by walking in the light, again, we, we also have this real sense of community with one another. And so one can, you know, we can tell, you know, we can get a sense of if someone's walking in light, right? They, they, they give that off. They got that vibe about them. You know, we know if they're the real deal in the moment, right? We know that about ourselves, unless we're living in denial. But that's why First John 1, 9 says, you know, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's, that's addressed to believers. That, that's believer confession right there. So we can maintain this sense of intimacy, with the Father and the triune God. So if we step out of the light, we choose to walk in darkness, we do this because of rebellion, but again, we don't lose salvation, but what we lose is this, this very real dynamic of spiritual intimacy, relationship, fellowship. 
Let me say it like this. Relationship can get messed up, but not union. Union can never be severed. If we choose to be rebellious, that that sense of relational intimacy can be interrupted, but union is never severed. You see, that's a very, very important distinction. And so, again, the means of rectifying, correcting, when we choose to to play the spiritual fool, found in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, will forgive us, purify us from all unrighteousness. So, again, what is confession about? Essentially, it's agreeing with God, saying the same thing about it that God says about it. Getting real with God. When we do this, we put away deeds of darkness, we walk in light, the light of the world. This is the the practical side of what we're talking about. So Hanukkah, pop quiz, it's about what? God being faithful, amen? And because he is faithful, what does that mean? There was light, once again, in a desecrated temple. A temple polluted by idolatry was made usable again for priestly service, corporate worship, because God is faithful, faithful in keeping his messianic, prophetic, redemptive hope, There was light in the world in the divine person, salvific work of Jesus of Nazareth. Because God is faithful, faithful to complete the work of redemption that he has begun in us, taking us from our initial justification all the way to our ultimate glorification. And all the wacky, zany bumps in the road in between those two points on our sanctification. He's with us every step of the way as well. Amen? Absolutely. So here's the deal. Whether you're Jewish or not so Jewish, got to get the inflection in there, right? It's the ethnic, not so Jewish. <laughs> if you're trusting, relying, depending upon the light of the world for forgiveness of sin, the reception of the Spirit, for the gift of everlasting life, for the resources to live differently right here, right now, my friends, you and I can get off that materialistic merry-go-round. We don't have to get overly stressed by consuming news from whatever source we choose to consume news from. We can have a God-centered view of the big picture where things are ultimately going. We can use this Hanukkah, an incarnation celebration season, as a time of rededication to the true and living God and His precious, precious eternal Son. That's really all I wanted to say today.